Um, so hi, everyone. Um, we're up to 67 people on the call, which is really lovely to have all of you today. So welcome to the Nourishing Student How Ontario Student Nutrition Programs Are Adapting in a Time of COVID webinar, which is co-hosted by Student Nutrition Ontario and Sustain Ontario. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carolyn Webb, and I coordinate what's called Sustain Ontario's uh, Edible Education Network. And I'll be introdu introducing the meeting and then supporting the discussion today. So I'll say I'm joining you from Ottawa, and I'd like to acknowledge that the place I call home is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I'd like to recognize that today marks the start of National Indigenous History Month, which is a time to honor the history, the heritage and diversity of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And this year, Indigenous History Month has started off in a particularly poignant way with the discovery of the remains of the 215 Indigenous children at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. And we know that these are only a small number of the countless children across the country who died from mistreatment at these schools. And so we, before we jump into our event, I'd just like to ask that we take a moment of silence together to acknowledge the children and their families and their communities, as well as to acknowledge the pain that all, um, the pain experienced by all those who continue to suffer trauma because of the former res residential school system. So we can just kind of take a moment to, to sit and have a moment of silence. Thank you. So we know that the story hasn't ended and that the legacy of colonization continues today. And the news this week gives us a clear reminder that we have the opportunity to dismantle existing systems that continue to cause harm and that we need to do whatever we can to make sure that every child can thrive. So in a moment, I'll introduce my co-host Vivian Degagné from Student Nutrition Ontario and she'll moderate the panel today. But before I do it, I'll just share a quick note of appreciation. It has been a hard year. I know it's been a really hard year for so many of you on the call. We appreciate that you've taken the time to be here. I also really appreciate that our speakers have taken the time to share their experiences with us, even as we're all waiting to hear about whether schools will reopen again before the end of the school year. Share a quick note about Sustain Ontario's Edible Education Network, and just to say it was established to support individuals and organizations who are working to get children and youth eating, growing, cooking, celebrating, and learning about healthy, local, and sustainably produced food. And we've been hosting a series of webinars um, like this one on how school communities are adapting their food programming in a time of COVID. Uh, those, for the most part, um, the past ones have focused on food literacy. But um, if you're interested, the recordings are all available on the Sustain Ontario YouTube channel, which is where this recording will be posted. So I will just go over our agenda quickly. We will be starting with our welcome. We will then have a number of presenters who Vivian will introduce you to in a moment. And then we'll move into breakout groups where we will talk about um, how everyone's been adapting to their um, to COVID. It'll be a time for people to share their own stories. So to speak to, yeah, how have you been adapting your program in light of COVID and to share any challenges or ask questions of each other. They, so it'll be a 20 to 25 minute period where you can just speak to your own context and share stories with each other. And then we'll come back for a very brief report back and um, share a goodbye. So, I'll note that um, we don't have any time for Q&A. We focus our spare time on those discussion groups and the conversation, but there will be um, time for some of those questions to be asked if you'd like during the breakout groups. Um, you'll be put in a group with one of the um, presenters um, or another member of, of one of the um, groups that will be speaking. And you're also welcome to ask any questions that you have in the chat box uh, during this, um, the presentations. So as a final housekeeping note, these presentations will be recorded and shared publicly afterwards. So I'll just work on recording your camera, um, I'm sorry, the speakers and their presentations, but if you want um, your video or your image to not be recorded, I'd suggest you just turn your webcam off. 
And then with that, um, just a big um, yeah, introduction. I'll, I'll take the moment now to introduce uh, Vivian Degagny with the Student Nutrition in Ontario, and she'll take things from here. So thanks, Vivian. Great. Thanks, Carolyn, for that. Um, just let me share my screen here. Close that. Oh. You can see your screen. So and am I on mute? No. No, you're good. Good. Okay. That's perfect. All right. So, um, as uh, Carolyn said, thank you very much for joining us today. We are very excited to um, share with you some of the um, different, I guess, some of the different um, models and some of the different um, ways we have managed through COVID and the pandemic. Um, so, as Carolyn said, I'm Vivian de Garnier. I am um, manager of SNOW, so Student Nutrition Ontario. I facilitate and liaison for them. And um, that's about it. So, oh, I've got the wrong one. Just a minute here. Sorry, folks, just a few seconds. I went and got the wrong one. Of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. There it is. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, Student Nutrition Ontario, SNOW, as we are known, is a collaborative network of 14 lead agencies. Dan, we can't see the presentation yet. Maybe, I wonder if you need to share the screen again and uh, make sure that that one is featured. Share. Do you see it now? Yep, just came up. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so each lead agency ex exists to administer, provide funding and support to healthy breakfasts, snacks and lunch programs across the province. In 2019-2020, we served over 97 million meals uh, in the year. During the pandemic and school closures, we served um, close to 16 million meals to at-home learners. And we support 4,486 programs across the province. We're funded by the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And we also work with many national, provincial and community partners who also help uh, support our programs. So um, I'd like just to take a minute to thank our presenters ahead of time for um, you know, taking the time to do this. It's a very busy time for everybody in student nutrition and I appreciate that you stepped up to the plate. So we have four presenters from four different uh, regions in the province. The first one is going to be Daniel Hobbs. He's the lead person for the Thunder Bay District Student Nutrition Program. Uh, the Canadian Red Cross Thunder Bay District is the lead agency for that region. Daniel has worked with local partner Roots Harvest to identify and reach virtual learners and ensure that they have access to healthy and nutritious food while being at home learning. Gerard Kaplan is a Food and Logistics Coordinator for the Toronto Foundation for Student Success. That is the lead agency for the Toronto region. Gerard will speak about TFSS's Nutrition Pantry Program. Uh, this program helps ensure that students have access to healthy and nutritious food during the, the current pandemic. So this particular program, I, I believe, started with about eight nutrition pantries and has grown to over 20. I think they're at 20, either 23 or 26, so it's really grown rapidly. Julia McCallum is also a Food and Logistics Coordinator for the Ontario Student Nutrition Program in Southwest Region. The lead agency in her area is VON Canada. Julian has been instrumental in developing a school food delivery program that she'll speak about. Um, this program has also been very successful in her region and has grown rapidly. Angela Fuchs is a Community Development Coordinator in Central East. 
Angela, along with some of her community partners, have come up with innovative ways to ensure youth in their region are fed while schools were closed. Heather Toma, who is the Food Procurement Coordinator also in Central East, will be helping Angela today. So welcome to our presenters, and again, thank you for uh, helping us do this. And that's it for me. Great. Oh, right, Vivian, you get to still moderate the discussion now. I was about to jump in, but. Oh, right. So does anybody have any questions about Student Nutrition Ontario? See any hands up? Not a very chatty group today. I don't see any questions in the chat box here. So no, I don't see anything. So if people do have questions for Vivian during the um breakout groups, uh, you will be allowed to, she'll be in the main room, and so you can come and ask Vivian about SNOW and, uh, and the student nutrition program in general. Great, thank you. So I guess we'll uh, just move along with our first presentation. So our first presenter is Daniel. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for making the time to come and attend this event. I'm looking forward to hearing from other people. Um, I'll start my presentation off here. So I'll be focusing on reaching the at-home learners. Um, there's obviously been a challenge. They're quite a lot easier to reach when they're in the school and you know exactly where they are. So um, one of the first things I'd like to start off talking about and what we've done is that we, uh, <laughs> we built our what we did off of a strong network. And I think this is a really key point that we uh, have here in Thunder Bay that I just wanted to, to highlight. Um, this is a group of people who got together. Uh, it was like the Monday after COVID hit and we all really worked together in that beginning part and that we all had worked together previously, whether that was in our advisory committees or through the Thunder Bay Food Strategy or other different organizations. And this group was really important and built a really strong foundation that allowed us to continue to work as the pandemic changed. And we you know, had to work at finding different new ways to, to reach these learners. Um, one of the things that was really important that when we started out our reaching at home learners is that we really wanted it to be universally accessible. We really didn't wanna do the kind of targeted approach um, so this fits in with the program guidelines for Ontario and how we reach, you know, want to have a universally accessible program. Um, and that would mean that no child or youth should be turned away based on their family's ability to contribute to the program or because there is a perceived need to, uh, to be in need of the program. Um, this also means that we're not feeding everybody either. So it's not, you know, everybody. Um, it just means that we're, you know, anybody who wants to access the program can have access to it. So the way that we really reached these students was through uh, electronic communication. Uh, the schools all had uh, virtual learners and we were able to send out emails or through other platforms that uh, different boards were using, whether that was Seesaw, Edsby, and different means like that. So we were able to communicate with the families so that they were able to decide on their own if they were in need and they could come to locations and pick up hampers. So we had four locations across Thunder Bay spread out geographically so that everybody could walk there. You know, it wasn't, uh, you didn't need to get on the bus. You didn't need to do those sorts of things to come and access the hampers. Um, so, we would send out an email or communication through the system on a Wednesday that the pickup would be on Thursday and at a specific time. Then the families could come and reach them. Obviously, there, if, you know, this required the families to make sure to check their emails, which isn't obviously the best way, um, but it was a way that we could at least get the first contact. 
one of the takeaways we had too was that we first were kind of, you know, when we started, we were treading, we, you know, dabbled our foot in, we didn't really jump right in and we didn't make any sort of solid commitment. We found that our numbers improved greatly once we were able to you know, have a really solid commitment that we were going to be there every Thursday for the next couple of weeks. And then the families didn't need to necessarily rely on the email. They knew we were just going to be there and we had already reached them as the added home learners and they knew to come and pick up the bags. When they did, we still collected stats, how many kids in the family, how many, you know, which school they went. So we were able to see and make sure that we were reaching uh, the kids. And this was their, their home school sort of was what we were asking. Obviously um, we're different virtually. Uh, when we started, we had 120 hampers going out by the end uh, before we switched to sort of a lockdown and all the school, all the schools were locked down. We were up to 250 bags a week. So there was a steady increase. And again, like I was saying that we noted as soon as we sort of had that commitment and people knew to come back every week, we were able to reach them that way. Um, and then just once school closed, we were, you know, the whole model changed, right? Everybody was an at-home learner. So we could really broadcast that over social media and other ways that we had reached students when they were, um, when everybody was out. So we used the internal communication to make sure that we really targeted the, only the online learners. We didn't broadcast it through uh, really public means. So that way we didn't have to get into uh, are you an online learner? Do you go to school? And those sorts of debate, you know, sort of questions that we didn't want to have to ask when we were handing out the hampers. Um, three, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. Um, so this worked for us, and this was just in Thunder Bay proper. Um, so it's a you know, we're a hundred thousand people. Um, and this was in the city. Once we got out into the district, we it, it turned into more of a targeted approach in the smaller communities because that model worked better there. Uh, principals obviously had a very good hand on who who were the at-home learners and who which families were in most need, or and they they worked it out that way. Um, Another part that I'd really like to highlight um, is this was for the virtual school and not a hybrid learning model. Um, so this, because of that, we had a, you know, a virtual school with a virtual, you know, class list and we weren't having to dabble back and forth. Whereas once the high school students went to a hybrid model, we had a harder time targeting them because they were mixed in with their home school. And that really made it quite difficult in order to, to target them uh, I like uh, as a whole, not to uh, target them, to give them a hamper, but to target them with the, adver the advertisement sort of to come and, and pick stuff up. Um, so that was really sort of an overview of what we did. Um, we had already, you know, sort of run hampers before. So the production part of it was quite similar to what we had done in previously. There wasn't really too many hiccups there. We had our procedures in place. Our pickup sites were also ones that had been used previously. So we already had relationships with them, uh, with those other organizations that they would allow us to use the space. Um, sort of the hampers were, were we, we produced them at Roost to Harvest, sort of as that previous picture had highlighted, uh, assembly line sort of thing like that. Um, so yeah, the big, the big things was just that it was really easy because of the virtual school setting. Moving forward with the hybrid model, I, I, it's definitely going to be more difficult. But the, at least the primary junior kids who are in a virtual school in our area are still in that virtual school. And that really made it a lot more easy to target, target those students with, so there wasn't an overlap there. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to thank all my partners who helped me you know, do all this. We were able to work with Roots to Harvest, UZ Ontario, Ministry of Children, Community Social Services, funding, Grocery Foundation, Breakfast Club funding. We were able to partner with the Northern Fruit and Veggie to get their products into the bags so we could help 
reach the students and stretch our dollars. And then of course the two boards here in Thunder Bay that partnered with us on this project, the Lakehead Public School Board and the Thunder Bay Catholic District School Board. Uh, and that would be all for me. Great. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, so if any of you have a specific questions for Daniel, you can save them for the breakout session if you end up in his session or even uh, through the chat um, and we'll try to answer them there. So our next presenter, I believe, is Gerard. Uh, so Gerard is with the Toronto Foundation for Student Success and we'll be talking about the nutrition pantries. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Viv, for that great introduction. Really appreciate it. I'm just going to switch over and share my screen. Folks seeing this all right? Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, uh, good afternoon. Um, like I said, thanks for the introduction. My name is Gerard Capellan. I'm the Food and Logistics Coordinator for uh, Toronto Foundation for Student Success. Um, and our catchment is in Toronto proper, uh, located in the Southern region of Ontario. Um, I'll be sharing with you our COVID Nutrition Pantry program, uh, an overview of how it all started, how it works, and the impact on our students. So the, um, you know, why did we start up a nutrition program? It really came from the need uh, to provide youth in secondary schools with healthy food to help nourish them while they were learning. Uh, in the Toronto District School Board, secondary students no longer had access to nutrition programs such as breakfast, morning meals, and the lunch programs. Um, students were going to school at 8.30 in the morning and then heading home um, at around 11.30 to learn virtually in the afternoons. Um, from there, principals immediately reached out to us concerned um, that these teens were going home to empty cupboards. It really is that call to action that we started uh, investigating and looking at several different ways to offer non-stigmatizing support, uh, also while observing COVID safety protocols at the school level. Uh, from there, we came up with the idea of the um, COVID nutrition pantries. So what does it look like? Well, um, I have an overview of kind of on the back end, what it looks like from our side, as well as the, the polished finished look on the school side of things. So these are kind of like really neat and tidy pictures. Uh, and then I'll be going through a little bit of the um, dynamics of how it all works. Um, so the COVID nutrition pantries, they really are rooms in secondary schools set up like a convenience store where students could discreetly select foods to take home. All of the foods were offered were shelf stable, healthy options that were already familiar to the students and their families. Um, we actually already had a prototype of the service model in the previous years uh, in which we sent food to secondary schools during the weekends. Now, with the nutrition pantries, we were now sending food during the weekdays and expanded the, uh, the reach. So the image on the left is actually our central pantry space, fully stocked up in operations. And on the right is the space um, that one of the school recipients has set up. So it's interesting because, um, you know, the sheer volume in Toronto is, and our density is so large that one day school started receiving the product, it could be anywhere from a half a pallet to four to five pallets of food. So, you know, the dynamic change, and we really had to guide them to be able to um, give them a heads up on scheduling, on the labor allocation, as well as, you know, um, some guidelines on how to distribute and store the products to the students. Now, let me tell you, over there on the left side, the good looking guy holding the bit of food on the left, um, it doesn't really show you how we put it all together. Um, that, that's very neat and tidy there, but um, it's, it was a huge undertaking um, and uh, in such a short period of time. So uh, we have a space generously provided by our partner, the Toronto District School Board, and made it into a distribution center um, specific to meet the demands of our students. Uh, the space was fantastic, I gotta tell you. And the location was ideal. We were centrally located um, off the highway so we can get uh, our trucks in and out. Um, 
And so now we had the infrastructure to pick and pack cases of food, similar to an Amazon warehouse. Now, the time to operationalize this was very challenging. Um, within six weeks, we mapped out our framework, purchased all of our shelving, racking, bins, pallet movers, and dollies to facilitate receiving and distribution of the much needed food out to the students. Now, while we were preparing the space, uh, we were also working on optimizing the delivery routes uh, within geographical catchment areas, communicating to our school sites to better inform us on their capacity to receive food, as well as projections on how much food we would need for our on-site learners. So on the next slide, let's explore how does it all work. So as I indicated before, we are very, very fortunate to have the Toronto District School Board as a generous partner. They provided us with a space to set up our central pantry, uh, which made it possible to accept um, in-kind food donations, um, purchase food in bulk with discounts, as well as the ability to get it out to schools quickly. We as TFSS, uh, we purchased, we assembled orders, meaning picking and packing, uh, as well as coordinated shipments to schools, and the TDSB provided logistical support and delivery uh, to our sites. In all, um, we had 21 secondary schools, 21 secondary schools in the most vulnerable and racialized slash marginalized communities that were supported by the COVID nutrition pantries. Um, as soon as we got a bearing on how that was working and it, you know, we got it in motion, um, we actually quickly expanded the service um, because we again heard from the principals that it was just impossible to start some programs um, due to volunteer capacity and COVID issues. So the service expanded uh, from the central pantry to support um, now the elementary students. Uh, we, we worked with those schools that couldn't open their programs but really wanted food for the students. Then we began shipping out individually packaged foods, the nutrition guidelines um, to an additional 63 elementary programs. All in all, the nutrition pantries uh, by TFSS supported 21 secondary schools and 63 elementary sites for a total of 84 schools. So, let's switch over to the next one. So while I'm in the thick of um, putting all this together um, and kind of operationalizing it, it's actually hard to uh, measure out the impact. We we had a we we really envisioned uh, a number, but we really didn't find out till we were calculating it in terms of how really how much more um, the students we serve. So in, in this slide, we're showing the impact on the secondary school nutrition pantry program. Um, so of what we achieved, we had served close to um, nine thousand students with a total of over two hundred eleven thousand meals which means roughly around 1,700 meals daily. With our purchasing strategy for the nutrition pantries for the secondary school, we delivered 30% more food uh, than if it was purchased uh, through traditional retail means. So the second part is when we were talking about the SMP support. Um, this one, um, we actually supported um, close to 27,000 students with a total of um, over 210,000 meals um, served, um, which is approximately about 1,700, 1,800 meals uh, on a daily basis. Now, what's a key interesting note here is that um, because of the format we were using, um, we delivered 62% more uh, food than if it was purchased with traditional retail. And the kinds of foods that we were purchasing were applesauce, fruit cups, granola bars, and other whole grain based snack options. So I'm looking here at kind of the, some aggregate um, numbers uh, for the support, both the nutrition pantries and SMP support. Um, and it's really interesting to see the quantifiable, quantifiable figures of how much we helped our school communities. Um, like I said before, when you're in the thick of operations and just working on just-in-time inventory management and ensuring that the right types of food um, get to the correct quantities and delivered to the schools. It's challenging to think of how many students benefited from this program. 
Um, so shown here are some key metrics. So when we're looking at it, um, we served over, oh, close to actually 36,000 students in over 80 schools uh, in our catchment area and around um, 421, oh, over to 421,000 meals uh, served, which equates to about 3,500 meals served daily. So it's interesting because the, um, the savings, which in turn really translates to more food to our students we achieved, um, were achieved through focused product selection, donations from partners such as Second Harvest and Breakfast Clubs of Canada, as well as better purchasing power through initiatives with Grocery Foundation and our own Student Nutrition Ontario initiatives. So um, I'd like to touch on a key strategy of forecasting real quick. Um, that was really crucial to be able to get the products that we needed in the timelines that we needed. Um, we employed that to ensure that, again, we had enough of the product uh, quantity and type um, for the delivery schedules. Um, we were in close communication with our vendor partners to be able to adjust for scheduling and other adjustments based on the impact of COVID in our schools. And as you may have felt both from your personal household purchases and through various food purchasing sectors, such as in education, social service, um, as well as the retail markets, the supply chain was volatile due to um, high surge in demand. Um, you know, everybody knows about the toilet paper issue, right? Well, you know, it, it really did happen as well with food. Everybody competing for the same products in the marketplace. Um, so the, as well as the labor disruption within the supply chain due to COVID related illnesses. So um, the COVID nutrition program um, ran from November, 2020 to April, 2021. The product and service delivery duration was a little bit more than four and a half months when adjusted for the winter break between December and January, as well as the school closures. And the map on the right uh, shows the areas the, of service provided. And for those who are familiar with the poverty issue in Toronto, our distribution model follows that very closely. So, um, looking at some of the impact uh, I pulled a couple of um, feedback and testimonials from some of the principals and students and their families. Um, and it was a significant amount of um, input um, and um, kind of great, really impact stories from the administrators. Um, it was really evident on how much food was needed and the, how much value was to their school communities. And it's really challenging because there's um, significant variability and uncertainty in the landscape in which we operate. But really, I think the keys to our success is always have a forward-looking outlook while being flexible and adapting to the needs of the students. Um, we know we're making a difference, but when we look at, when we took the time to let it all sink in and hear from the schools, it really feels rewarding to be part of this initiative that has benefited so many students and their families. So thank you for your time. I look forward to chatting more in our breakout sessions. If you guys have any questions, I look forward to chatting more later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Gerard, for uh, your presentation. Very uh, exciting. And I think um, you gave enough information that uh, you know people, I think, would be able to replicate this quite easily in some of their regions if they choose to do that. There was a few um, questions for you in the chat. If you want to go take a look, that would be wonderful and maybe answer some of those um, while the next presentation is going on. So our next presenter is Jillian McCallum. Uh, Jillian is from v um, yes, VON or Ontario Student Nutrition Program Southwest. Uh, her lead agency is VON Canada. So. Um, Jillian is going to be talking about a food delivery program, a school food, food delivery program that they've moved to uh, during COVID times. So welcome Jillian and off you go. Oh, you're on awesome. mute. There you awesome. go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Vivian. Um, I'm really looking forward to presenting today. As Vivian mentioned, I'm the Food Logistics Coordinator for the Southwest Region and I work in the Ontario Student Nutrition Program. So I'll start by sharing my screen here. Bear with me for one moment. Can you see that okay? All good, Jill. Awesome. 
All right, when the pandemic hit, VON's lead agency was looking for ways to revamp our direct delivery programming to support schools during these challenging times. We recognize that schools would encounter challenges when attempting to purchase safe, affordable prepackaged food and produce items to operate their student nutrition programs. As such, VON OSMP rolled out the school food delivery program as part of our COVID-19 response. Over the next 10 minutes, I will give you a high-level overview of the school food delivery program, which was the method to support schools over the last year. Schools opted out of receiving their OSMP grant and instead participate in a school food delivery program. This program model offered weekly deliveries of produce and the opportunity to purchase and or receive food credits to order additional supplementary items at a competitive price. Schools had the choice to select from two different menu options. Menu option one was more of your low prep pre-washed produce that would be sent in bulk, more like apples, mini cucumbers, and pears. This option allowed for a bit more variety in the menu and a school might offer this menu option if they had the means to serve these items. Menu option two was more of your pre-packaged option. Um, so items like clementines, bananas, and applesauce. This option allows schools to operate an SNP, even though they might not have had the capacity they traditionally would have outside COVID. We had three intake periods, as you can see there. Um, this gave us the flexibility to opt in or out of the program also by breaking the program into phases, it gave OSMP the flexibility to shift supporting schools, um, students at school to at home relatively easily. In the next slide, I'll run through a couple of statistics with you. These stats are specific to our phase two. Um, in the Southwest region, we have just over 450 schools and of those schools, 220 participated in the school food delivery program. In phase two of the 220 schools that participated, 59% were targeted. On average, in phase two, 34,000 plus students were reached in one day of the program. In one day, there were over 5,000 pounds of banana sourced. In another day, over 17,000 units of clementines were procured. On average, each week, over 120,000 plus units of produce were secured and delivered to the doors of schools. This slide shows um, the schools that participate in the school food delivery program. So as you can see, the two um, black dots here, um, the black pin here more um, in the Northeast, um, surrounded by the yellow pins. And that is Produce Express, one of our two main distributors who are located in um, Woodstock. And they were able to facilitate direct delivery on a weekly basis to the schools here that are pinned in yellow. And the pin, uh, the black pin that is surrounded by the purple pins is our other main distributor, Evans Wholesale, and they are able to facilitate weekly deliveries to the schools here that are pinned in purple, as well as that they had the capacity to service the schools a little bit more remote up here um, in the north in our Grey Bruce community on a bi-weekly basis. As the program progressed, there were opportunities that were made possible that I'll briefly touch on. March marks Nutrition Month, and as an agency, we thought we'd capitalize on the opportunity to celebrate with Dietitians of Canada. In the month of March, in the month of March, each week we substituted one of the baseline produce offerings with a more favorable item. Some of these items were cantaloupe chunks, pineapple chunks, broccoli florets, celery sticks, and carrot sticks. Once the substitutions were determined, we worked with a dietitian to create resources that we circulated with the weekly menus. Schools were encouraged to use the resources as they deemed fit. Some schools read them on the morning announcements, shared them on their social media platforms, used them in their lessons, and the list goes on. Here are a couple examples of um, some of the resources. Are you able to see the new share? No. Yeah, all good, Jill. Awesome. So here are just a few that were circulated with the weekly menus. As you can imagine, due to the limitation on what schools could serve and the method to do so, there are only so many produce items that we could secure and send to schools. Due to this, the menu lacked in variety. One of the community partnerships allocated some community funds and worked with us to enhance the menu offerings. For example, in one week, one of the baseline produce items were replaced with 10 grapes and another week, 10 sugar snap peas and one mini cucumber. 
Both of these options were pre-washed and individually packaged into bags so schools could easily distribute them in a safe manner. These two program enhancements, one, the partnership opportunity, and two, the community investment, are two ways that we're able to demonstrate endless possibilities to tailor the program as we address changes on an ongoing basis. Here are a couple of testimonials that were shared with us. So this testimonial was um, from the owner of one of our two major partners who are, are heavily involved and invested in the work that we're all doing. So I'll take a pause here and let you read it. All right, and this was feedback given by a coordinator at one of our schools in Grey Bruce, Tracy, and she's from Sprucewood Community School. And not only is she an SNP volunteer, she is um, a trustee at the Blue Water School Board. And this is a testimonial from a principal at Lucknow Central Public School. And again, I'll pause for a moment. And with anything, there are opportunities. With a lot of direct delivery program we have facilitated over the past several years, we have been able to capitalize on some opportunities. This year is no different. If anything, it has presented more. Two opportunities that I'll briefly speak to is that it can one, create infrastructure and assist in capacity challenges and can streamline partnership opportunities. So as mentioned, having trucks on the road, there are infrastructure opportunities and can assist in addressing capacity challenges. The school food delivery program is similar to our two flagship programs, the year-round delivery program and the vegetable and fruit delivery program, with a few modifications to ensure we're meeting COVID requirements and protocols. We worked with our two major distributors to offer food credits to schools, so the schools could act as a one. So the school food delivery program acted as a one-stop shop for schools to purchase and receive food in a safe manner. For example, at the beginning of phase two, schools received food credits where we uploaded funds to their online accounts. Schools could purchase food by the online system and this food would be delivered weekly with their baseline produce that we secured via these partners. And here's a really quick overview of the online ordering platform. So it won't take a lot of time here to go through it, but I'm sure you'll get the gist of it. Um, so schools were able to purchase um, any of these items with their food credits um, that they either purchased or received and then would be delivered with their preset menu baseline options. Sorry, you have about three minutes left, Julian. Perfect, thanks Vivian. Having trucks on the road delivering to schools weekly has definite advantages and has given OSMP the ability to streamline partnerships. One example could be when product is donated from a provincial partner like Breakfast Loves of Canada. By trucks already on the road delivering food to schools, we can include donated product like yogurt, eggs, and applesauce to accompany other food offerings. Or another example could be while purchasing grocery foundation vouchers. In the past, we worked with the grocery foundation, one of our main distributors, and a grocery store in our region. We predetermined the product, the volume that we required, and worked out the logistics to bulk purchase other products or the voucher products. Having the means to streamline direct delivery programming has made working with various partners and stakeholders slick and we're able to pivot in a timely fashion. The response from the program participants, whether it's the students, the volunteers, community partners, has been overwhelming due to the model and meeting the needs of the programs, especially during these uncertain times. With that, OSMP plans on rolling out the school food delivery program in September as part of our direct delivery programming. This year on the grant renewal, we included a section where schools could express interest on whether or not they would like to receive grant funds to participate in the traditional grant program or if they would like to participate in a school food delivery program. Currently, we're on target to support roughly the same number of programs again next year. We've learned a lot this year and have, and have worked with our community partnerships and stakeholders to ensure we're meeting the needs of the programs while streamlining our direct delivery program as much as possible. I would like to thank you for taking the I would like to thank um, each and every one of you for allowing OSMP to present on the school food delivery program. 
Also, I would like to thank SNO and Sustain Ontario for organizing the opportunity for all of us to come together and talk about how Ontario SMPs are adapting during COVID. I look forward to connecting with some of you during the breakout sessions. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out directly as I'd be happy to connect. I'll turn it over to you then. You're muted, Vivian, still. Vivian, you're on mute right now. Okay, trying to get it off. Sorry. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Jillian. Uh, sounds like you've had a very busy year, but uh, really interesting and uh, exciting, the work that's been done in the Southwest. And, I can see how the schools would uh, love that, that model. So uh, if you want to check the chat, uh, like I said to Gerard, I think there were a few questions there for you. So next is Angela Fuchs, and Angela is from the Central East uh, region, Peterborough um, Child and Family Centres. Angela is going to be presenting on some innovative ideas that uh, they have come up with in their area. So welcome and uh, thanks for joining us here. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for that introduction and uh, thanks for having me. So I'm just gonna uh, share my screen here and hopefully you can see that and you can hear me okay. So yeah. as uh, Vivian mentioned, I'm the Community Development Coordinator for uh, Student Nutrition Programs in Peterborough City and County. And I'm going to share the story of how COVID-19 impacted our programs here in this area in Peterborough City and County. And um, show you how the community came together and we were able to put an emergency food program together for students and their families. So, uh, So, you know, in this area, we have student nutrition programs in 51 schools and uh, with about 17,000 students that have access to the programs. So within a few days of the schools closing, I started receiving emails and phone calls from principals, school staff and parents asking if there was any kind of food support available while the schools were closed. And at that time, I had been coordinating the student nutrition programs in this area for about five years. And it was typical for me to be communicating with principals and school staff and student nutrition program coordinators, but never before had I had parents contacting me directly looking for support. That was definitely new. And at that point in the school year, which was the end of March, most of our funding and resources had already been distributed to schools, but it seemed like there were a lot of families in crisis, parents were losing jobs, and people were looking to me for answers. And I knew I didn't have the resources to help everyone who was looking for support. Then one day, Ashley Aiken, the general manager at Corth Food Share, which is our local food hub warehouse, uh, she gave me a call. And student nutrition programs in this area had a long-standing relationship with Corth Food Share. And uh, I had hesitated contacting Ashley because I knew that they were being overwhelmed with everything. As you know, Gerard, I think it was mentioned that uh, supply chains were a mess, and um, food banks were looking for food, and they were busier than they had ever been before. So when she called me, it was so great to connect with her and hear what she was thinking. She was thinking some of the same things that I was. And we wondered, now that schools were closed, how could we continue to get food to students who normally relied on the school nutrition programs? Um, Ashley had also been talking with Jen Klusterman, who was the director at the Bridge Youth Center and Rose Powers from Pre Peterborough Youth Services. And both of those ladies also had relationships with Corth Food Share and also worked with children and youth. So all of our worlds were changing quickly, but at the same time, uh, you know, it was difficult to get anything done and put things together. People were working from home, uh, you know, navigating new safety protocols. There was a stay at home order. We were all concerned about the same things, but there were a lot of barriers. So we decided to come together and have a virtual call with the four of us. So during that call, we quickly realized that we were all trying to solve a problem which we could not tackle alone, but together we were able to develop a solid plan and the Feeding Youth and Families Together program was born. And we didn't know exactly how we were going to be able to get food to the students and their families, but we started with some basic ideas and then things quickly fell into place. Um, we needed a location, we needed food or funding, we needed volunteers, we needed to be able to communicate our plan to the families and we needed to do things safely. So that meant some support from um, and guidance from our public health. 
So our first thoughts went to a location. We needed a place that had space to store food, but also where we could distribute food to families, families in a safe way with all the COVID-19 safety protocols in place. And quickly, Jen offered the bridge as a location. And so this is a picture of the Bridge Youth Centre, which turned out to have a fantastic space with this large parking lot where we could direct one-way traffic through as people were making pickups. And it was close to the downtown area where many families would be able to access it by uh, walking or using public transit. So the bridge also had this large warehouse door, which was really convenient for receiving food deliveries and allowed for good airflow inside. The inside space was perfect too, as it already had several refrigerators and a big open space for storage and space for volunteers to be able to be distanced. Um, we had considered trying to run the program at a local school, but our access would have been more limited. And there was just a lot of barriers at that time for, for this that we were trying to put together quickly. So the next thing we talked about was food. And Cortha Food Share had received several loads of emergency food boxes from F Feed Ontario at that time. And we knew those boxes were going to continue to be delivered over the coming weeks. So we decided um, to get things up and running as quickly as possible. Ashley offered the food boxes to get us started. And we, we started with those and then hoped to be able to build on it as soon as possible. But just to quickly get things going for that first um, delivery day or pickup day, we use those emergency food boxes and you can see them on the right there stacked up inside the bridge. So at the same time, um, oh sorry, sorry, this is a picture of myself, Rose, Ashley and Jen on location at the Bridge Youth Centre and um, those are all the Feed Ontario boxes that are stacked up and ready to go. So it was by the second week of running the program that Kortha Food Share then was able to donate and purchase some fresh produce and then eventually we were able to secure some um, additional funding for the purchase of dairy products and eggs and um, one of the ways we did that was through our Food for Kids Committee which is the nonprofit community organization which supports the local student nutrition programs here in Peterborough. And so they committed to purchasing some dairy products. Um, we also received an emergency grant from the COVID-19 Community Response Fund. That was through um, the Community Foundation of Greater Peterborough and United Way. And that helped us to make some of those uh, purchases through the summer months as well. So at the same time, our lead agency, the Peterborough Child and Family Centers, which is the flow through agency for um, the student nutrition programs in Central East, they were working with um, all the community development coordinators in Central East and, and we were pulling together any funds that hadn't yet been transferred to schools or, um, you know, there was, they were organizing some additional emergency COVID-19 funding that was coming through the Grocery Foundation and Breakfast Clubs of Canada and then also through the Ministry of Chil Children, Community and Social Services who gave us additional funds for summer programs as well. So we were putting the bits and pieces together as we went along and um, then at that time also our Food procurement coordinator Heather Toma jumped in and helped us with some bulk purchasing of some dairy orders and working with some of the local distributors who we were already working with while schools were in and student nutrition programs were running. And they were really feeling the effects of COVID-19 at that time too because they had been working with restaurants that were no longer operating, etc. So um, to be able to use some of these funds to support those local food distributors um, just it was a great partnership that was already there and we were able to continue to work with them so it was really wonderful so um now we had the location and the food but we we didn't know or we knew we couldn't pull it off unless we were able to recruit some volunteers so because of the restrictions we were dealing with at that time we were limited to the number of volunteers we could have on site as the months went on those numbers changed so we were you know continuously navigating that throughout um, so we started asking family and friends as well as some of the regular volunteers from the bridge and a few of the food for kids committee members rose from peterborough youth services she was on site most days and coordinated the volunteers as they were stocking the warehouse and they did that on mondays and wednesdays and then food was distributed to families on tuesdays and thursdays um, so everyone just brought so much energy and enthusiasm and it was really a, a team effort and the volunteers were just amazing. 
So next, we need to be able to communicate this initiative to school families. And because I already had an existing relationship with the school principals, um, we decided I would send an email to ask the principals to refer families to the program and also share all the program details with them. And that principal referral process allowed us to get information to families who needed support while still maintaining an element of confidentiality and trust. It was really important for us that families could feel comfortable coming to pick up food and not have any stigma attached to that. And you can see there, there's a car, it would pull up, the food would be loaded, and then they would drive off and the next car would come in place. Two minutes left, Angela. Okay. So while all these preparations were being made, we were also in communication with Peterborough Public Health and um, to make sure we were, uh, you know, following all the public health guidelines. And um, we needed everything to be safe for the volunteers as well as the families that were coming. So once we had our plan approved by public health, we were ready to start sharing food with families. It, it all seems a bit of a blur at the beginning, but if my memory serves me correctly, our first virtual call with the four of us ladies was on May 1st, and by May 7th, we were distributing boxes. The first day we saw 72 families, but as the months went on, we typically saw between 100 and 130 families each day. Um, the community just came together, and eventually we started seeing school staff coming to pick up food and deliver it to families who weren't able to be there too. So we wrapped up the program on Oct August 27th and in the end we were able to provide food for just over 600 unique families. There's an overview of um, the program. So the food went out to approximately 13,042 adults, youth and children. There was tons of fresh produce and boxes given out um, and we also were able to donate some reusable masks, which at that time masks were difficult to get. So that was wonderful. We had a lot of donations for those. Um, and finally, when we started to this program, we, we committed to only running it for a few weeks, but when we realized how many people were accessing the program, we knew we wanted to be able to continue until schools reopened. So each of the organizations on their own, we could not have met the needs of the community at that time, but together we were able to bring our own unique resources and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, looking back on it, I would say it all came together quite easily, but in reality, this was a lot of hard work and it was only because of the commitment of so many people that we were able to do this successfully. So with that, I would just like to say um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about this initiative and I appreciate being here today with you. Great. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it looks like or we can see that, you know, the families in your area were very lucky that you were able to pull everything together so quickly and start serving your community. So uh, that is all for our presentations. Um, thank you to all of the presenters one more time for sharing what, e what each of you have done in your communities in order to meet the needs um, during this crazy, crazy time. And um, then I'll turn it over to Carolyn. We're going to move in into our breakout sessions, I believe. And she has a method to do that. Thanks so much, Vivian. And uh, I'll echo Vivian's comments with just a big thank you to all of the speakers for sharing your extensive stories of changing within um, days and weeks. And uh, just a, yeah, big um, kudos for all of those efforts that made everything happen. So I'm gonna pause the recording now. Um, just put the recording back on so that we can record a few of the, the pieces that um, folks share back. So in terms of our next steps, we have eight minutes left. And I'll just ask each of the um, session facilitators to share, sorry, just one minute of some of the key ideas or um, themes that emerged during your presentations. And... Maybe I'll just go through um, each of the group. Heather, are you okay to speak? Sure, yeah. Um, we had Catherine from Toronto in our group, so we were able to talk a bit more about the Toronto program and um, about how that works in the schools. And um, then folks presented some challenges. One was about accessing refrigeration um, and being able to purchase appliances and things taking a long time to actually arrive and thinking about ways to to uh, solve those problems. Also, we talked about use, use of grocery gift cards 
for when schools were fully closed and it was harder to move actual food around using the grocery gift cards. Um, the fact that when we go forward now, we'll most likely have a hybrid model where we'll have some learners at home and some learners in school and that that's going to be really something to think through how in terms of human resources and logistics, how do we manage that? So I think that's going to be further conversation that will be helpful to have. Um, and people just really also spoke about being able to have the community connections that could happen on Zoom and not having to drive, especially in rural areas, to meetings and to schools, not being traveling as much. We could communicate in other ways with more people on Zoom and that, again, post COVID, hopefully we'll be able to go back to in-person, but also maintain the relationships that have developed um, on Zoom and that that will really be a, a strengthened network that can happen. Um, that's a few of our Thanks, Heather. Topics. That's a that lot that you just super so much that you talk just covered in that one minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll ask Dan to present uh, just a quick overview next. Yeah, so we talked a lot about different uh, models we were doing and different things like that, but a bigger kind of overview, I guess, was sort of how the models have changed pre-COVID. We were, you know, that universality and how that shifted through this pandemic and then sort of started into what, what it might look like post-pandemic or as we transition further into the future here, because it really has changed the role of S&P and what it was, and now it's a lot a lot more different with hampers. We're doing summer programming, a lot of those different things that are really not traditional to what we have been doing in the past and what our role might be moving forward. And then we talked about a few of the different challenges we've all had. Um, one obviously was that probably wasn't discussed was privacy was a big one. Um, you know, when we are targeting people, their information, do we have access to it? Who has access to it? And those sorts of challenges. Um, and uh, all throughout, you know, the board, it, we, I think a lot of us gave the, you know, gift cards to the board because they had the information and we weren't allowed to have it and those sorts of barriers to, to actually reaching the students during this time. Thanks so much, Dan. Glad a good discussion was had. Uh, Gerard, can you share back? just as it's one of the rare times where I get to talk about me instead of other people. Uh, really just um, kind of get a little bit more in depth in terms of operational components of the work. Uh, and I think the crux of it is being able to leverage um, partnerships and not just that, but the information that we hold in terms of who's buying what, being able to push that in the direction where we can impact pricing um, as a collective for core SKUs um, and communications. It really is a lot of folks out there are willing to help. They just need a little visibility line of sight. Uh, when I was talking to our vendors, our service partners, uh, really what they want to do when COVID emerges is that how can we help our students, right? Um, they have their priorities. Like my suppliers, they, we have our hotels. Usually they're tier one group. But you know what? You let me know what you need for the schools and we'll get it to you. And really that's the commitment they made to us. Um, and But, you know, that came with like, what's the time frame, what's the volumes, and that's kind of working back and forth within the schools and our school board partners, uh, as well as their donors, you know, what do you need? Um, and being able to have a great communications team, being, having a great development team and executive leadership, uh, being able, was it, we were able to put out a package to be able to get those um, key components out to our students. Thanks, Gerard. All right, two more, uh, Jillian, you can quickly share. I'm going to pass over Kelly Brace. She was so willing um, to um, record the notes for us. Super. Great. Well, I think um, you know, the first comment when we um, broke out was recognizing that there were many creative ways um, to adapt to the pandemic and that the pandemic was a challenge for everyone. And there was no right or wrong way. And, and Jillian reminded us to celebrate all the wins, even the small ones which I think was really important. Um, she talked, Julian shared with us a few of the pros and cons, um, some of the challenges and successes that she had with, with her model. And, um, and then we went into, we talked about there some really good questions um, that were raised. What happened when schools were closed and direct delivery to schools was impossible? Um, the environmental concerns uh, and impact when we had to move to a program where the food was prepackaged and individually 
um, in individual servings and, and the environmental impact on that. Um, there was some discussion around supporting remote schools. Um, some of the program models are easier to implement in our urban communities. Um, and then the last point is supporting local, um, trying to, to su support those local food um, suppliers as much as possible. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, and then last, uh, Angela. Yeah, so we um, we had some good discussion uh, with Anita from Guelph Wellington Dufferin and Helen from Kingston about uh, what they were doing um, with their programs. Um, Anita talked about a food delivery program that they had put together and Helen was working on um, the, the, her work was focused with seniors, but also, you know, shared information about how do you store food and, and finding that space to be able to do that when you're when you're undertaking these huge projects, right? Um, and then we also heard from Sherry in talking about how much all those extra grants, those emergency grants and the the extra money that came from the funders um, through the organizations that student nutrition programs always are, are dealing with anyway, the Grocery Foundation, Breakfast Clubs of Canada and the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services and how important that funding was to be able to get us through those times. Um, and then we also just talked about the future and what does that look like and, you know, rising food costs and that prepackaged um, food that we have been leaning on this past year and how, what, what the funding for the future is going to look like and the possibility of more grants and um, what, how to, you know, talk to our community partners to have them uh, as part of that conversation too. So yeah, some good conversation we had. Great. Thanks, Angela. I'm really glad that everybody had some good conversations there. And we always wish they could go longer, but um, uh, yeah, gives a, a start at least. And um, so here's our second last slide, um, but just sharing the different contact info for our speakers. We'll share it on, uh, Sustain's going to do a summary post just with some of the info and um, we can share this info. And uh, I guess I'll just close with a big thank you to all of you who, for being here. Big thank you to all of our speakers and facilitators. Um, and then, as I said, I'll post the recording online and you'll likely receive it tomorrow along with a post-event survey. And uh, we'd love for you to just respond to it. There's just a few general questions where you can share your feedback and uh, encourage some future conversations. And I've heard loud and clear that a training on Zoom and breakout groups would be helpful. And so I will work on how to figure out what that could look like. Um, and so, with that, just a big thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.